section out of C.S. Lewis. This is mere Christianity, but we're doing the ethics section because I thought it was interesting, kind of on a standalone. Um, tonight, we'll get to his take on sexual morality. If you have specific questions about marriage, he actually does that in the next section. So we'll do sexual morality this week, and then he does marriage next week. So don't know if that helps you any. There's some overlap, obviously. Um, he starts off with an admission that we're not surprised by. Chastity is the most unpopular of the Christian virtues. Right. Uh, it's probably one of the things people think of most when they think of what are Christians for and against. They think about views on sexuality and whatnot. And that was in 1942. Uh, so I have to think it is at least as true now. Uh, I'm going to guess probably truer, uh, if that's a word, more true than it has been. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about even the word chastity. When was the last time you heard the word chastity in a sentence? It's not a term we throw around at all, so it, it is a pretty dated section, and yet some of it really will apply. First point he wants to make, which I think is really great, is there's a difference between chastity and modesty. Okay, And his argument is rules about chastity never change. Rules about modesty come and go. So, for example... Is this young lady dressed modestly or not in her swimsuit that comes down to her knees? Okay. Probably that was quite quite the scandalous image at some point, but uh, I think we're okay with it now, by and large. Um, wear that to church, be fine. Uh, so he, he's making a distinction, because what tends to happen is we lump them all together, and then one of the modesty rules changes, and someone says, see, you know, all that stuff about sex and stuff, it just comes and goes and changes. And he says, well, yeah. these are a fair bit more permanent than these are. These move around from culture to culture and time and era, to, but the others not quite as much, which I think is probably fairly accurate. Um, and so you have to treat them differently. He says, breaking the rules of modesty for the purpose of exciting lust offends chastity. He says, if you're, if you're immodest and you're trying to get somebody to do something sexually they had not have been doing, he says, well, then that's a problem all on its own. But on the other hand, breaking the rules of modesty for other reasons is more like bad manners. So if you wear something that in a particular setting is inappropriate, you, know, you, you weren't immoral. You just were unaware of what was expected in that particular setting. Okay. And that's going to vary from time to time and place to place. And he says, you know, don't get too bad out of shape about it. Uh, he says, so differences in rules of modesty, uh, he says, they should be acknowledged and not judged. When one generation dresses differently than another generation, just kind of acknowledge that. And he, and he goes both directions. He says, younger folks, just be aware. Older folks grew up diff uh, dressing differently than you. Okay, and again, it's 1942. And he says, older folks, just be aware. The rules have changed a little bit on modesty, so don't get judgy about it. Just be aware that that's a moving target from culture to culture and setting to setting, and don't get too uppity about it. Uh, he also mentions something that he doesn't spend any time on, so I'm going to because I think it's an interesting topic. He says, furthermore, we don't even get modesty right when we talk about modesty. Uh, does the Bible talk about modesty? It does. Interestingly enough, none of once in a while somebody will say, "Preacher, about time for a sermon on modesty." And if you look at the verses about modesty, it has nothing to do with what that person thinks I should be saying. Kind of interesting. Let me just read a couple of them. First Timothy two nine. Likewise, also women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control. There's our word. So what is modesty? Not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire. So the verse isn't about she's dressed skimpily. She's not wearing enough. Oddly enough, modesty in this context meant she has too much on. She's gaudy 
in her presentation, which is the same way it's used in 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, the perishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Modesty doesn't even pair in that verse, but the sensibility is you might put too much on. How many sermons have you ever heard about y'all wearing too much clothes? Right? It's just a very different take on it. Um, oddly enough, Church of Christ Heritage, if you want to know, Alexander Campbell, uh, the legendary preacher from our background, um, he did write on the subject of modesty. And in one of his articles, he talks about how embarrassing it was to go to church and see people dressed immodestly. And you say, what did he mean? And he explains to see people dressed like they were going to a formal ball with clothes that were trying to show off their wealth. He says, what we ought to see at church is the instruction given to Moses, take the shoes from off your feet, the place you stand is holy. He said, when you come to church, you probably ought to be dressed like a slave because you're there to worship your master. And you throw in heat. It was, it was a tough article to read and I don't think caught on. But uh, one of the rare guys that you'll hear back in, in history say, you know, stop showing off at church. It's kind of interesting. So all that to say, um, much about what the Bible says of modesty concerns wearing too much, not too little. You know, reference the plating of hair and gold and so forth, of showing off of wealth. Now, if you want a side note, so I told you, every so often somebody says, preacher, we need a sermon about modesty. The word you want to use to preach that sermon you think I ought to preach, oddly enough, is a different word. It's the word naked. In the Bible, when it talks about what we describe as immodesty, it doesn't call it immodesty. Modesty meant being humble and reserved. Nakedness meant put some more clothes on. And so when you read passages of Scripture, those are actually the ones you want to reference. So, of course, I'll put them on the screen. Genesis 3, 7 through 11 is the first time it comes up in the garden, right? Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? So the first time it's introduced, a pair of people who are naked, and he says, we noticed we were naked, we tried to put some clothes on, God said, who told you you were naked? Anyway, so that's the first time the concept is introduced really early on, and then in the Levitical and uh, Mosaic law, it comes up with reference to priest quite a lot. You shall not go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness be not exposed on it. Pause a moment. What does that sentence mean? Okay. They're not wearing pants, they're wearing robes. And he says, be careful going up the steps to the altar so that people underneath see your nakedness, right? Because they, they literally have a robe on. And so he says, be careful what you wear when you're climbing the altar steps. You're a priest, you can't be flashing the crowd. Okay, and the word he uses is not immodesty. It's again, nakedness. Nobody wants to see that. And then he explains in detail, like there's a whole section of the Bible on priests not being naked. Exodus 28, 43 for Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. Why is it so important to give such detailed instructions for making clothes for priests? Because they're going to stand on the steps, and it kind of matters. You shall make them for glory and for beauty, and you shall put them on Aaron and your brother, and on his sons with them, and shall anoint them, and ordain them, and consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. You shall make for them linen garments to cover their naked flesh. They shall reach from the hips to the thighs, and they shall be on Aaron and on his sons when they go into the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place, lest they bear guilt and die. Right. So again, the word is not modesty. In Scripture, the word is, is nakedness. Don't flash people. And, and the instructions, that's actually as close as you'll ever get, other than the application for church camp or something, of like how long your shorts are allowed to be. And, and it was priests, um, when you go up the steps, if they're looking up your robe, you're too short. 
that that was the explanation of modesty, uh, or again, nakedness, as, as they would say. Okay, Lewis then, having kind of touched on those two words, modesty and chastity, then wants to spend the rest of his time talking about chastity, which again is just the older word for the Christian sexual ethic. And he gives us, as he's prone to do, a couple of bad ideas to notice first. Um, I, I'm going to elaborate on it a little bit because I think it's important. Um, there's two basic views in history about the body. Okay. On the one hand is materialism. And I don't know what the symbol of materialism is, so I just used the rock. But it's the idea that all you are is your flesh and blood body. That's it. Okay. And so don't worry about ethics, morality, any other things, because you're just DNA in motion, matter in motion. Okay. On the other end is, in the Christian context, the doctrine of Gnosticism, which, as we all know, comes from Yoda. Uh, you may know the quote. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. Oh, luminous, or, you know, like that. But luminous beings are we, not this crude matter, he says to Luke Skywalker. And what he's saying is, your body just barely exists. We're all just force ghosts waiting to come out. Right. So the ancient Gnostics in the time of John, for example, believed that material things were corrupt to the point of being utterly evil. And the real you is entirely spiritual. And so your goal is to escape the flesh and be ghost Yoda. Okay. And this is discussed on the pages of the New Testament. Well, which one's right? Are we purely mystic energy or are we just matter in motion? As you can guess, because I always do this to you, I give you two options and say it's door number three. The Christian view is actually in between. We are more than just bodies, but we're not less than bodies. Even in the resurrection, you don't come back as Casper. The trumpet sounds and the dead rise, like bodies come up out of the ground. Right. So God wants you to be enfleshed. Jesus put on flesh and lived among us. Is flesh evil? Apparently not, because Jesus had a body. He was a body. And even that body was raised from the dead. And it was the blood of that body that atones for your sins. So apparently material things aren't evil. And, and is a body. I, I'm, I'm a believer in the bodily ascension. Like, I don't think that changed. Um, that said, are we merely bodies? No, there's, there's more to us. Um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are all in a tomb somewhere. But Jesus says, God's the God of the living, not the dead. And they are, in some sense, still very much out there, ready to be united with their body. Okay? So my point is, Christians, because of that, are able to have a positive view of the body which is kind of rare in religion. Buddhists, for example, material things are all, they're all Yoda. Okay. Material things are all bad. You need to escape the body. Right. Uh, most, in fact, Gnosticism probably comes from the East. Most of the Eastern religions have some tenet of that, that this is bad and you need to escape it. Um, Christians can say, no, having a body is a good thing. God made that. And he looked at what he had made, and he said, it is good. Yeah. So for the Christian then, you say, what does that have to do with sex? Well, obviously, it has to do with your body. Because Christians have a positive view of the body, we can then have a positive view about the discussion of sexuality. And sure enough, when you listen to people talk about sexuality, there's kind of two extremes there, too. One we might call romanticism that the only thing in life is about finding perfect romantic love, finding that perfect someone the universe wants you to be with, and then you live happily ever after, and that's the way it goes. And then you do a sitcom called How I Met Your Mother, and you explain to your kids how the universe puts you all together. Right. That's, that's romanticism. And then there's realism that would say, no, none of that, nonsense. Um, 
Sexuality is about having sex. You're human. You have a body. You have needs. Go do that. Don't care. No right and wrong. Okay. Christianity says, well, neither of those is quite right. <laughs> there is not a special soulmate, someone out there for you. The person you're supposed to be married to is the person that you marry. Stay married to that person. But neither is marriage and romance and relationship and love meaningless. Sex does have a meaning and a significance beyond just matter and motion. See, because we have a complicated view of the body, it's more than just matter. We have a complicated view of sex. That's, it's not one or the other. It's not the ultimate extreme of self-fulfillment is to have great sex. Neither is it just like having dinner. It's something you have to do to stay alive and keep the species going. We have a higher view of it than that. And that's something that Christians have that I, I think a lot of folks don't know that we think. I'm not sure what makes me wonder. I don't know if all Christians think that, which means I probably need to talk about it more. But I, I think it's something we do believe when you really get down to it. So what then is the Christual, Christian sexual ethic? If those are the extremes on either end, what, how would you describe it? And Lewis says, inescapably, you're going to end up with this word monogamy. That is kind of the root of what we think. He says it like this. There's no getting away from it. The Christian rule is either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. Um, if you Google any of those words in your Bible app, you don't find them. Like it's never stated as clearly, even C.S. Lewis puts in a little quote, it's like, it's kind of like this. He's paraphrasing. There's no passage in scripture that says, Here's exactly what it is. Write this down. Commandment number 11. Okay. But the sense of it is work. It's, it's baked into the cake. It's the sense of it is in every story you hear about a relationship. It's in the Old Testament. There are lots of people who are, for example, not very monogamous. How does that end? Abraham has more than one woman that he has children with. How does that work out? Happy, happy family, happy tent. No, terrible. Um, Jacob, he's got a couple of wives. They're sisters. That goes well, right? Not so much. Solomon, serial dater, right? <laughs> Married every woman in Egypt, and then some ended well, right? No, like people point out, well, you know, there's lots of weird stuff in the Old Testament. And I always want to say, yeah, I know. And it always ends terribly, which is kind of the point of most of the stories. Like the, these are deeply flawed relationships maybe from the outset because of choices that were made along the way. So again, baked into the cake is the idea that what God intended could really work. Every time you tinker with it, it gets worse. So don't go tinkering. Um, I would want to expand a little more on what Lewis says about it and to say, I think the craziest thing about the Christian sexual ethic is it has very little to do with sex. What Christians believe about sex, they believe because of what they believe about marriage and covenants. And let me walk you through that and see if I can make my case. Matthew 19, 3 through 9 is the kind of controversial passage where Jesus gets asked about divorce. Okay? The Pharisees come up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And in a little historic background, there's two different... Uh, Jewish kind of schools of thought on marriage. One said, you know, you pretty well ought to stay married. The other one says, if a rabbi moves from one town to the next, he may need a new wife in the next town. Like marriages were very temporary. Um, I think it was Josephus who wrote that he divorced one of his wives because of cooking or something. Like it was just, she displeased me. So it was very kind of flippant, take it or leave it kind of relationships. Jesus says, well, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father, his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two should become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So Jesus is teaching and sex hasn't even really come up. He says, what you need to know is about one. What did God do? It doesn't really matter what you think. What did God create? He built the relationship. In fact, he invented the species to function in this way. If that's what God intended, then that's best. 
Now they ask him, oh yeah, well, why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Like if that's what God wanted, doesn't the Old Testament talk about divorce? And, and it does. Tangent. This is a tangent on my tangent. That's going to really something now. What I think happening in the Old Testament is men were displeased with their wives and just putting them out. Not divorcing them, just abandoning them. Okay. So in the ancient world, what is life for a single woman who can't remarry because she's still married? Her husband just threw her out of the house. There is no career there. There is no there there. There is no life. And so what Moses says, since you scumbags keep abandoning your wives, if you're going to put her out, you have to give her a writ of divorcement so she can go and start a new family and live her life. You can't just put her out there to die. And I think that's what it means. And I think that's what Jesus is saying. It was because of the hardness of your heart. You were being terrible people and you weren't going to stop. So to protect your wives, Moses allowed divorce. But that's a long way from this is what God wanted, right? It was more of a accommodation to humans being awful. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And it's only here at the very end that the idea of sexuality even comes into the discussion. The whole discussion was, what did God intend for marriage? That's the question. 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 18, Paul's going to do the thing, same thing. Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. So the Corinthians, very loose sexual ethics. The, the temples employed prostitutes, if that tells you anything, right? It's one of the ways you work at, worship the Greek gods was through prostitution. So he says, well, let's go ask what Genesis said. And he quotes the same verse Jesus quotes. What's the question? What did God intend at the beginning? That's the answer, full stop. So he quotes the verse, says, Two will become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. For other sin as a person commits outside the body, or the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Is this what God intended? No. And then the sexual ethic is based on the marriage ethic. It's almost like, almost, don't misquote me, almost like Christians don't have a doctrine about sexual rules. We have a doctrine about marriage. And that has implications for the sexual questions we want to ask. So in your uh, Hebrews 13, 4, let the marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulteresses. Again, watch the order. Marriage, marriage, then we can talk about sexuality. It's quite often when that topic comes up, marriage comes up first because that's the biblical concern. And then based on that, now we have something to say about sexuality. So if you ask Ben, what's the Christian sexual ethic? I'm going to agree with Lewis, more or less. I just want to emphasize the way the Bible kind of spells it out is God defines marriage. Marriage is a covenant relationship where God puts two things together. You're supposed to honor that. And then every other question about sex then gets run through that knothole. Would that sexual practice be marriage honoring or not? And that's how you answer every question. What would this do for marriage as God intended it if we did X? And that's just a different way of thinking of it. To say it another way, the radical belief of Christianity is that faithfulness to covenants and honoring God are more important than sexual fulfillment. The worldly ethic is sexual fulfillment comes first, and then if I can keep covenants in the midst of that, I will. The Christian ethic says, first we keep our covenants, we honor our God, and then we trust that he built something in there for me to be satisfied in other ways. But one comes before the other. Now back to C.S. Lewis. Tangent of a tangent of a tangent. Come back. Okay. Why do we find monogamy so difficult? Why is it unpopular? Let's, why do we make you do it in front of witnesses, by the way? Anything about that one? 
from all, go back to medieval times and well before marriages, weddings happen in front of witnesses. Why? You're going to be held accountable. We kind of expect you to have second thoughts down the road and say, well, I'm not sure about this one anymore. And we want to say, yeah, but that one time you stood in front of a priest and you said these words and we all watched. So, okay, so what, what is it about monogamy we find so difficult? Well, Lewis has some guesses. He says, monogamy goes against our nature so strongly that it is either wrong or our sexual instinct has gone wrong, one or the other. You know, it doesn't match up. It's one of those cases where what your body tells you it wants and what your God says you need seem to be way out of whack from each other. And again, if that was true in 1942, I would think probably all the more so now. He says, evidence, this is a funny section. He gets, I, I think C.S. Lewis was hungry when he wrote this section. He can't stop making comparisons between sex and food. The whole chapter is about food. I was hungry by the end of the chapter. Evidence is that our sexual instinct have gone wrong. He says, sexual appetite is way out of proportion to other desires. He says, starving people wouldn't pay money to go watch somebody cook. But sexually... Um, unsatisfied people will go and watch someone in the nude, right? He says, like, we have a desire. We'll just watch it from a distance. We're that desirous of something to do with it. He says, we wouldn't do that with any other desire. I would point out this was before the Food Network. <laughs> and maybe, like, there's a lot of cooking shows. I'm just saying. But anyway, his point is, it does, I think it is fair to say, maybe he cheats a little on, you know, gluttony's a real thing. Drunkenness is a real thing. Like There are other desires that we let get out of hand. Absolutely. But I think it is probably fair to say, what human desire are we most likely to allow to overwhelm our good sense and rationality and conscience and experience and heritage and teaching and tradition and like everything you know on one side and then sex on the other and sex wins? There aren't a lot of other desires that do that. Maybe greed. You know, I, mean, I don't know. Extreme greed would do that. But that one seems to be a pretty strong one. And, and Lewis says that's evidence that it's out of balance. You shouldn't have a desire that strong. That so easily tips you off into doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. It shouldn't be that easy. He says that means there's something wrong with the desire. Not... Not the way it should be, but the way it currently exists inside of us. We're damaged goods when it comes to sexual desire. Yeah, okay. I, I, that's one section of the chapter I chewed on quite a lot. I'm not sure, but maybe. He says, furthermore, it's not because uh, it has been repressed. And here again, it's 1942, and he's arguing with Freud and these guys who say, you know, what the real problem is all you Victorian people with your repressed sexual values that's why we're all confused. And Lewis said, oh, maybe. <laughs> or maybe we just really like sex. Yeah, that seems to me to be the issue. I, I don't, he would make the case that he says it's, we've never been more hypersexual as a culture and more interested in sex than we were in 1942. Again, only if I had a time machine. So let me show you a few things, Clive. Uh, let me show you how things have gone. But uh, he would say it's the other way around. Sex as the way to reproduce the species is nothing to be ashamed of. But that's not what we glorify. In fact, in most sexual relationships that exist in modern times, getting someone pregnant is the opposite of what you want. That means failure at the game. The sexual competition is to have as much sex as possible and not get someone pregnant. So again, the way we think about it is kind of the opposite of glorifying motherhood or fatherhood or anything like that. The part of it that we glorify is not the part the Bible would say, that's great, God made that. So, um, and then he also mentions, don't be naive. There's lots of people that use sexual gratification and interest in sex for money, for profit. Um, I'm a big fan of the show House. Uh, 
doctor show, Sherlock Holmes kind of guy, mean to people. I mean, it's everything I want to be in life. So it's it's really great. But it's so it's produced by Fox uh, ten years ago or so or more. I don't know. And I was kind of rewatching it some the other day, and just thinking, you know, every every opening scene is someone getting sick, right? That's how you start a doctor show, a medical show. Someone gets sick, and then they go and house solves the problem, right? It's like seventy percent of them, someone takes off their clothes in the getting sick scene, right? Either they're in the midst of passion, or they're having an affair, or something. They're at a club, or something. Why? Why did Fox Network think, you know, it would really help a medical drama? Nakedness. Yeah, because they know what people want to see. And they thought, well, we'll get them hooked on that scene. They won't change the channel during that. And then they're going to be curious how House saves the day. House keeps his clothes on. But the patient in the first 30 seconds is probably going to be naked. And it's kind of, again, the people that they know, they're not dumb. They know what sells and they put it in there. It wasn't for storytelling purposes, is my point. It didn't add to the medical mystery. Like, oh, I wasn't sure, but then they were naked. No, it, it was just to get me to watch the commercial afterwards. So that kind of surprised me on a rewatch. Just especially now, you watch it the first time, and then you watch it the next time, 10 years later, with your kids in the room. And you go, hey, I don't remember that being in the show, right? And it's kind of an awareness of, yeah, huh, interesting. So Lewis says, before we can be cured, we must want to be cured. And that's the other problem with struggling with the sexual desire is, you know, we don't really want to get better. We kind of like it. If that's broken, don't fix me. You know, and that's kind of the attitude we take towards it. And we make a lot of rationalizations. Why is this desire difficult to control? Well, one is because uh, we rationalize it as natural. Again, hey, it's natural. It's just what people do. This is not new, by the way. It is probably the first excuse given. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Deeply misunderstood verse. Verse 13. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and for the Lord for the body. It's a weird verse because it seems like he changes subject midway through. It's because I left off some quotation marks there. This section, food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, is a quotation, I'm convinced, of some kind of Corinthian cliche. When we have cliches, when we want to justify something, we just say, ah, you know. So a Corinthian cliche was food for the belly, belly for the food. And what that meant was, hey, if it's natural, just do it. Your belly was made for food. Food is made for your belly. Eat good food. What does that have to do with sexuality? Hey, your body was made for sex. Sex is made for your body. Just enjoy it. See, Again, the, the rationale is it's natural, so it can't be bad. And Paul says, yeah, it'll burn. Like, he has a positive view of the body, but not so positive that anything your body wants to do is a good thing. He says, God's going to judge what you do with your body. It does matter. The body is not meant for sexual morality. It's for the Lord. What is your body created for? In the beginning, God made man and woman and said, hope they have fun. No. In the beginning, God made us and said, these people need to bring me glory. They need to serve and worship me. You were made to honor and glorify God, not to satisfy yourself. And that's a reversal of that. Other reason, uh, we make the excuse that it's impossible to control. Again, such a strong impulse. I just, nothing I can do about it. It's the way I'm wired. Um, another passage in 1 Corinthians, you probably also misunderstood. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I don't think that passage means, if you think about it really hard, you can overcome any temptation you have. I think it's a promise based in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in Christian life that God doesn't leave you to these temptations. And you're absolutely right. Me by myself might see things that I'll fail at over and over and over again. My life history says that's the case. 
what God is saying, it might be more than you can handle. It's not more than we can handle. That God is going to work with you on the inside if you're a willing partner. Again, as Lewis said, you've got to want to be cured. But God wants to cooperate with you and overcome even this difficulty we see in our life. Final note, and then we'll pause for some discussion because I know you're just anxious to ask me awkward questions. He says, sexuality is not the center of Christian morality. Why does he throw that in? The reason I think he does is because there is this tendency, apparently in 1942 and now, to say, what do Christians believe in? Well, let's start talking about sexuality, right? It's like, it's, like it's our lead-off hitter. So we're, in case you didn't know, we're having some classes down the hall with the young families, and, and one of the things we're talking about on Sunday mornings uh, this subject has come up about sexuality and modern questions of sexuality. And one of the things I've repeated a couple of times is, I have convictions on this, but this isn't my leadoff hitter. By which I mean, somebody comes to me and says, tell me about Jesus, I'll say, well, let me tell you about sexuality. It's like, no, I mean, we'll get there. Jesus has stuff to say about it. But it's not the first thing I want to tell you about Jesus. There, there are some other things that might be in line first. And even about morality. Is sexual sin the worst kind of sin? Lewis would say, not even the top five. Like, it's not at the top of the list. And he references, I think, Matthew 15, 10 through 20. And he called the people to him and said, Hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Again, noticing in the connection between food and sexual ethics in this discussion. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And Jesus says, Oh, no, I shouldn't have said it. No, he says, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They're blind guides. Blindly the blind. Both fall into the pit. So Peter says, Okay, great. Explain the parable to us. And he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Like, do I have to explain the digestive system to you, Peter? It's a fun sentence. Well, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. So the context is about washing hands, but the point he makes is the real problems start on the inside, not on the outside. The outer things, even these, are symptoms that start in the human heart. So if you ask me where does Christian sexual ethic begin, or ethics in general, it starts with the heart and what kind of people we ought to be in the image of Christ. And so Lewis then lands his chapter with this great haymaker that I just love to read to a room full of people because it's fun. That's why a cold, self-righteous prig who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute, but of course it's better to be neither. <laughs> love, love that line. And his point is, he says, there's lots of ways to go to hell. Uh, he says, you look at a prostitute and say, oh, well, they're in trouble. But if you're greedy and awful and terrible, just because you happen to have a tight rein on your sexuality and do everything else wrong from the heart out, you're not better off. You just notice that more. Right? He says, now don't get me wrong. Is he glorifying prostitution? He's like, no, better to be neither, right? Don't do either one. Don't be bad. Okay? That's Christian sexual ethics in a nutshell. Don't be bad. Okay? He says, but don't assume that because you're not doing one thing, you're a good person and that person over there, well, they're a mess. I think in our culture we have today, so fast forward from 1942 to 2022, we've put uh, sexuality once again in the driver's seat of a lot of conversations, and we're just really fixated on it. And there's a reason for it. I mean, it's everywhere. Uh, every side of the culture war is geared up and ready to argue about it like all the time. There is a right and wrong in there. Again, to Lewis's point, better not to do anything bad. But we've gotten hyper-concerned with one particular slice of Christian morality and at times have traded it in on all the others. Right. Getting your sexual ethic right while being proud doesn't gain you any points. Okay. Discussion time. 
These are questions I suggest, or as always, do whatever you want. What do you think of Lewis's distinction of modesty and chastity? Is that fair? And then throw in nakedness, because I did that one too. Do you agree that the sexual desire is more difficult to control than others? Why or why not? I'm kind of curious about that one, actually. I don't know if we'll go that route or not. But I'm sure that it's stronger for somebody. But there might be somebody who it's not. So I'm just curious. Anyway, have Christians overemphasized our sexual ethic? And why do you think that? Do we talk too much about it? Not enough about it? Um, I, I can answer that one. Uh because I'm the preacher and you tell me what you think, right? There's always one guy in the church that's like, you talk too much about this. And then there's another guy who sits in the same pew, I'm sure, who says, you talk way too much about and not enough about, and they sit next to each other. So like all of us have an opinion about what the right amount of talking about sin is in a church. And I'm sure we're doing it wrong, but uh, it's pretty hard to get it right. I can tell you that. Okay, now I'll stop. What do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> I feel like one thing that puts my focus on number two, um, sexual desire more difficult to control than others, is that it's placed in front of us so much. Yeah. You know, it's the saying sex sells, and the bottom line is the bottom line. Yeah. So therefore, um, that's what's put in front of you as a temptation more than anything else. So in, in terms of profit and who benefits, there's a lot there. Availability, nearly every human comes with the necessary parts. So again, just prevalence, there's something to be said there for that. Um, and then Lewis just barely touches on this because it's 1942. But I'm talking about a guy ahead of his time. He says, and contraceptives are not going to help us on this topic. That's 1942 in a world where sex can also not have certain types of consequences, right? That, I'm not necessarily anti-contraceptive. I'm just saying that not having a consequence makes the desire that much harder to deal with if it's not going to cost me anything. If I can do this without consequences that are obvious, uh, if I eat too much, I am going to get a stomach ache today. I will not sleep well tonight. I might be able to go commit adultery and, eh, you know, who cares? So again, the consequences, that's changed the debate a little bit. I think, I think you may be right about that, that it's more, it's not so much that what's inside is more broken, but the circumstances might influence it a lot. Yeah. Going on to that, um, it's, it's just not impossible to, to escape it in general. Yeah. We have to carry around devices in our pockets that can access, access it anytime, anywhere, um, at any point, and then we take those devices and give them to our young children and say, okay, now use this properly, and then we, off you go. Yeah. Um, and when you're constantly, continually inundated with it, I mean, grown men and women of all ages struggle with it. I think, I think the latest um, thing, the latest um, statistic was 75 to 80% of men sitting in church watch porn monthly. I mean, it's a problem, sure. because always it's available. Yeah. The, so I've referenced two shows now. Let's go for a third. So I did How I Met Your Mother and uh, House. So now there's a great West Wing episode <laughs> uh, where they're talking about, I think this is late 1990s, where they're talking about the future of the Internet and technology. And the, the old guy is really grumpy about it. He says, technology is not that great. And the young guy's like, hey, the Internet's pretty good. What about that? He said, it's just a faster way to get porn. Where's my jetpack? And his point was, like, his generation was promised technology would do all these wonderful things. And he says, what do we use it for? Not always the greatest things. I, I'm not, I don't have a jetpack yet, but I, I've got these other things that I probably didn't need in the first place. It's a funny episode. Anyway. I'm okay. I'm okay. I think all the desires are well the same. In my mind, I mean, yeah. It, it's all a, for society, it's all a, a way to, you know, make you feel, yeah. you know, the sexual desire, you know, you're trying to fill this void, you know, the, the mm -hmm. food, I mean, yeah. the money, uh, all those things. It's just another way to, it's already, and that's something that's going to be very blessed. 
got them all free from us. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going on and on to this, but it's just it's one thing after another. We have access to all of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, to me, I mean, it's, it's not like that stands. That maybe it makes us feel the worst because it's the sexual desire. As Christians, we think that is the worst one. Right? But they're all pretty accessible. So when there are consequences, they seem to be larger in the sense of having a baby you didn't expect as opposed to being overweight. Like, what's the cultural cost of that? You know, there, there's that. So maybe that's why we think it's worse. I don't know. I tend to think it varies by person. And then back to your point, by, by what's available. Not everybody's going to have the same weakness, though. Yes, ma'am. I think with kids, because that's what I work with, they're, they are so starved for attention right now that they're trying to get it through sexual means rather than doing it at home. Or yeah. I just see a lot with the younger kids, just young girls, and it's just so sad to see how starved they are for attention that they're going down that path. Yeah, yeah. And there's... Going into one more question three, over and emphasizing. I think we both over and under emphasize. Now you're shouting. Sound like a preacher. <laughs> we have thrown the topic out. <coughs> Dress this way. Don't do this. Yeah. Make sure you don't bend over a skirt. Make sure you cross your legs at the ankle, not the knee. All those things <clears throat> to the point where I don't know how far back it goes, but I know my generation, a lot of women have. Big, just shame. I'm a woman, and I have all these parts, and men they look at me, and oh goodness, I this is what I have to work at. I mean, just yeah. what can I cover more? And the, the real problem wasn't properly presented or properly emphasized. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No. I had a conversation with a lady at Glenpool who was telling me this story. She had gone to the supermarket and she's an attractive woman, but at the time she was, it was fall. So she has a sweater on with a turtleneck, like, you know, up to here and a dress down to like scraping the floor. Right. So short of burka, like this is the picture of all you can put on. And some guy hits on her in the, fr the fruit aisle. And she says, there's nothing more I can wear. I said, yeah, I, I don't think that's the issue here. <laughs> like, that's not how it's going to work. Uh, so we've come at it from the easy ways that we thought, well, y'all put more clothes on, that'll fix it. And again, as Lewis says, aren't all of our problems starting on the inside? Why do our solutions start on the outside? Uh, it's, that's no good. I feel like all I was ever told was good girls, good Christian girls don't do this. That's all, all you're ever told. And then, so then when you get married, how does that work? I mean, there were so many girls I knew who wanted to get married just for that. Yeah. Because it wasn't really explained, like, this is what it's supposed to be like. Yeah. It's just that it's a bad thing. You don't talk about it. You don't do it. And that just makes everybody want to do it more. So. And boys are told the same thing. Or, Christian boys are told the same thing. Don't touch. Don't look. So then when two good little Christian boy and girls get married, there's confusion and shyness and all kinds of crazy parallels. This, this is actually a line from Lewis I didn't put on the screen because you're tempted to think of Lewis as like this fussy conservative English guy. And he says, um, I do not think that a very strict or fussy standard of propriety is any proof of chastity or any help to it. And I therefore regard the great relaxation and simplifying of the rule which has taken place in my own lifetime as a good thing. Now again, relaxation from Victorian England. Right? It didn't stop relaxing. So, I mean, we could say, oh, hang on, you know, but, but in 1942, he's like, you know, being super stuffy in the century past didn't make us better people. So there's that. As I'm always going to say, and as Lewis will say, error always comes in extremes on either end, right? So pendulum goes the other way. Being completely loose in our behavior and inciting lust doesn't help either. So Christianity is about figuring out what does character look like in between there and not thinking we can fix it with a, a ruler per se here and here. I was just going to say, I, it, it really is about that balance because if you think 
back, I think Daisy, he might be kind of referring to this, but promise regeneration. There was an article, I don't know if you know what that is. So it was a big movement within Christian churches to push girls to make a promise that they won't do anything. How do you think I am? I know what that is. <laughs> I was in high school then. Yeah. Yeah. So the idea was you don't. Yes. So you don't. You don't. You think yep. that is sexually immoral. But then it wasn't really defined what that is. So then these girls have this real shame and guilt that they feel like they've yeah. done something that doesn't fall within that line of the things they thought. But you can't take your ring off because then everyone will be mad. Right. Right. And so yeah. <laughs> it was this whole thing. So I really think that that was too. It, you're, you're not talking to the kids enough to let them. Have real conversations that yeah. sexual desire is a thing, yeah. and then you know it's kind of the reaction to they're so inundated with it mm-hmm. everywhere else. The promise ring idea was get them to do things that they're above all of that. But if yeah. you can have a real conversation, be married to Jesus, right? Yeah. 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 Promise ring. I was there. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, but yeah, you're going to teach us how to do this, right? In that Sunday morning class. Oh right? yeah. Slides, got it all. Ready to go. Yeah. It's it's the next week I'm going to be absent and Carla's going to fill in. And she's, she's going to yeah. So Sarah, you had your hand up. Well, I was just thinking. I mean, I go back. We're going back and forth with comparing um, you know sexual immorality and 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 I mean, babies are born with an instinct to want to eat. And yeah. so, you know, from birth, we've, we've understood that as parents or as humans, we, we have to, you know, put yeah. something in our body to live. But that whole physiological drive that creates that sexual desire, that one is thrown at boys when they're, what, 12 or so, maybe younger, and girls a little bit later. Yeah. Maybe when they're 15, 16, but it's just, it kind of throws a curveball in there. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we kind of, people were born with knowing the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good oh, point. The modeling of the functional yeah. family, the modeling of the love, <coughs> the functional Christian, yeah. or just even functional marriage. Yeah. That food, literally, from your first breath, you're being trained on an, uh, how to manage your food craving. Uh, some of us still struggle with it. Can I tell you a random story? I'll, I'll come back, I promise. So a couple weeks ago, I went to preach up in the Tulsa area. And as I was going through, I thought, oh, driving through Glenpool, I got to stop for dinner at my favorite Chinese place. Okay, I've been there in three years. I walked in, and the lady behind the counter says, Oh, hey, sir, long time no see. <laughs> Three years. Recognized me, 100 pounds lighter, and was still like, where'd you go? I said, I moved. She goes, really? And I said, yeah. Apparently, I ate there a little bit too much, is what I'm trying to say. I might have had a problem with General Tao Chicken. So even that, like even that, we struggle our whole lives. You're managing food and still struggle with it. But then the sexual desire kicks in at about the same age you stop listening to your parents and and you're trying it's a bad time to learn to manage that it's if we're especially if we're hurting the the home where that's supposed to be taught and managed anyway right because parents are going to have to to navigate that yeah it's just a weird design you know yeah just that it's almost like you isn't the test well yes also, God wants us to do that. Like, having babies, he's in favor of. So he does He does make it conducive to that, right? There, there has never been any risk of the human species dying off because we got tired of that, right? So, I mean, he, that part of it, biologically, he did fine, you know. And then it's us that are like, well, I don't like having to manage this. If our complaint is God made it too enjoyable, I mean, that's kind of a funny complaint to make. But, yeah. Does violate the Christian ethic or the sexual morality? We just write them off. We mm. don't try to help them come back into the circle and embrace them for who they are really. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Ye
especially young pregnant women. Yeah. Because they are the most obvious, like, oh, here's a consequence. So, shame. Yeah. The, somebody else was involved. I know how the math works, uh, but that young lady's in trouble. So, yeah, we've, we've done a bad job of helping them, of saying all the things we need to say, and then at the end saying, and when you screw it up, come back and talk to us again. You know, we're not done with you. And that's that's hard to do, all of it. I think it would be helpful to probably kind of the word desire as not always negative, it's probably yeah. like, like we did yeah. last week. Yeah. Like when Paul switches, if your purpose is to please God, desire is still present, but it's properly placed. We're trying to do that again, like and even on our logo, like the word, the idea of passion driven is that there is a such a thing as a good passion, a good desire. It, it just we put it in the wrong place or don't manage even even a good desire unmanaged. All right, it's bad. Okay, you guys had lots of things. Oh, Jamie, last one. No, 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 you raised your hand. You have to say it now. Um, well, I was raised a lot like you, like Katie said, with you do not, do not, do not. And I've tried to, with my kids, I've tried to talk a lot about glorifying God in all we do, especially with our body. So how do we eat? How do we drink? How do we move? How do we, what does God say about marriage? And if we follow what he says about marriage, we're going to be healthy. Yeah. If we, if we are making choices that puts our body at risk for all kinds of infection, yeah. not only are we talking pregnancy, but we're talking yeah. long risk complications. Um, you know, that, that's a choice you make and, and it's, it's for glorifying God. I want to use my body to glorify Him. And it is a, a beautiful thing that He created for marriage. So trying to be really open about it's a good thing yeah. for a marriage. Um, but if those choices are made before that, and then they've made choices before, you're with, I mean, the, the risks are just high for unhealthy and whole. I'm just going to say amen to that and let you have the last words because I can't improve on it. That's good. So, Ladeo Gloria, all to God. Yep. Next time we'll fix marriage. <laughs>